Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here let's learn how to use Unity Lobby. This is their tool for helping you create online lobbies for your multiplayer games, which you can join along with your friends and start playing together. As a host, you can create a lobby, give it a name, make it public or private, you can update the lobby data, which can be whatever you want, like for example a game mode, and as a player, you can find public lobbies, or join a private lobby with a code, set some filters, or use Quick Join to join automatically. The goal with this tool is to handle everything related to lobbies, and related to that are two other Unity Gaming Services tools. I've already made an extremely detailed tutorial on how to use Netcode for game objects. Watch that video to learn how to actually send data between the players after the game has started. And in the next video, I'm also going to cover the Realme tool, which helps you easily connect your players without requiring IPs or port forwarding. All three of these tools can be used separately, or they can be used together in a really seamless, easy way. So in this video, let's learn all about Lobby. I'm going to focus on going step by step, showcasing just using the functions and showing how the API works with no visual. And in the end, I will also showcase a visual sample that I built myself, including all of this functionality. You can download the final demo, the project files are linked in the description. Also, this video is officially sponsored by Unity Gaming Services. This is a collection of tools for helping you build, operate, and grow your games with ease. It includes all of the tools that I'm going to mention here netcode for game objects for adding multiplayer to your games. Lobby for joining players, really for connecting them. There's also a dedicated game server tool, one for matchmaking, Vivox for voice and text. You have CloudSafe for storing player data in the cloud, CloudCon delivery for delivering apps to your players. You can explore your game analytics, do some A-B testing, monetize with ads, or do in-app purchases, or a bunch more. All of these tools are either completely free or they have generous free tiers, so click the link in the description to learn more about TNT Gaming Services and get started for free. All right, so lobby. The first step is to install the package. So let's open up the package manager. Then let's go up here into the Unity registry. And now just scroll down until we find the lobby package right here and just install it. The next step is to set up a project with Unity services. So for that, let's go up into edit, then project settings, then go into services. Now make sure you are signed in. If not, you can click on the button over here on the top left corner to sign in. Then over here, you can create a brand new Unity project ID. So you can do that through here, or if you already created in the dashboard, let's go into this one, then select your organization, select your project, and link the project. Okay, that's it, the project was linked. Now we can go into the Unity dashboard, and over here on the left side, let's go down into multiplayer. Then we've got all of the multiplayer tools, so over here, let's go into lobby. Go ahead and click on the button around here in order to enable lobby. That takes you through the setup guide, so let's follow all these steps. First of all, link the Unity project, so we already did that, let's go next. Then install the package, we also did that, next. Then make sure to turn the lobby on, next, and that's it. If you want, you can import the samples to see how lobby works in the context of a bigger sample. But for now, let's keep things simple for this video. Just go ahead, finish, and that's it. That's the basic setup done. Now back in our project here, let's begin by making a new C-sharp script. Let's call it test lobby. Let's make a game object to run it. Here, let's attach the script and open. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is initialize Unity services. So let's make a private void start. And on start, we're going to go into the Unity services. This is inside unity.services.core. Let's go into this one and just call initialize async. Now, importantly, note how this is an awaitable function. So in order to run this properly, let's add await in here. And once we add an await, we need to make sure that this function is also marked as async. Now, if you're not familiar with async and await, don't worry too much about it. You don't need to know how it works in order to use it, but essentially what this does is it lets you run code asynchronously. So for example, over here, this will send a request to Unity services in order to initialize the API. That request is going to go over the internet, so it's not instant. If you did not make this async and did not use await, then the game would pretty much freeze until it received a reply from the server. Whereas by using these keywords, this way the game does not freeze. When it gets to this point, it sends off the request and then just pause the execution of this function and the rest of the game keeps going. Then when this function receives a response, then continues executing down here. But like I said, you don't need to worry about it. Just don't forget the async and await keywords. Okay, so that's it for initializing these services. Then lobby requires authentication to use. Unity authentication has tons of options. You can link a Steam account, Apple, Android, Facebook, or OpenID. So you can ask the player for access in order to create an account and link it with any of those services. Or something super awesome is you can just do a super quick anonymous sign-in. Over here, we just go inside the authentication service, this one, inside Unity Services Authentication. Then let's access the static instance. And now we just call in the sign-in anonymously async. 
And again, this is an awaitable cost, so let's await. Basically, this way it's completely invisible to the user, so there's no need to ask them for any username or password, it just happens automatically. Then the future, if you want, you can upgrade this anonymous account into an account linked with any of those services. Okay, so this will sign in anonymously and create a new account for this user. We can listen to the event to know when the sign-in completes. So let's go inside the authentication service, inside the instance, and let's listen to the signed-in event. So over here, let's do a log saying we've signed in, and we can grab the authentication service instance, and let's grab the player ID. So this is the player ID that was generated. Okay, so with this, we have everything we need in order to get started working with Lobby. So first things first, let's handle creating a lobby. Let's make over here a function. So private void, create lobby. Then over here to create, let's go inside lobby service, inside unity.services.lobbies. On this one, let's access the instance, and then we're going to call the function create lobby async. This one, as you can see, takes a lobby name and the max number of players. So let's define here. So a string for the lobby name. Let's call it just my lobby. And then then for the max players. And let's say we want four players. So over here, the lobby name and the max players. Okay, so this will create the lobby. And again, note how it's awaitable and it's going to return an object of type lobby. So let's grab that one. So first of all, make it await and then use the object of type lobby. So this one right here inside unity.services.lobbies.models. So this is the lobby that we just created. And to verify that we did create, let's do a debug log just to see it. And again, in order for a way to work, we need to make sure we mark this as async. All right, that's it. So this code here is going to create our lobby. Now, one very important thing is that all of the functions related to lobbies, all of these can throw an exception. For example, if it couldn't create a lobby or somehow it could not connect to the lobby server, if we don't catch that exception, that could break our entire game. We don't want that to happen. So let's wrap all of this inside a nice try catch. So try catch. And we can catch of type lobby service exception and just do a debug.log on this. Just that way, in case there's any error, we can see what caused it. Okay, we're almost done. And just for testing, over here, I'm going to be using the quantum console. This one is an excellent asset that lets you easily add a console, read the logs, and trigger functions. However, I should point out this is not required. You can call this lobby function from anywhere. But in my case, for testing for this video, this asset is super useful. So in order to make it work with that asset, I'm just going to add the command attribute. Okay, with this, let's test. All right, here we are, and right away we can see that the authentication is working. So we signed in, and this is the generated player ID. And now let's call the function, so the create lobby function. Let's run that function. And there you go, create the lobby with the name my lobby and with four players. All right, great. So far, everything is going really good. We can verify that it did work by looking in the dashboard. Over here in the dashboard, if under lobby we go into overview, over here we've got a whole bunch of sets. And we can look and see, yep, we've got one request right now. And down here we can see request by type. Yep, we've got a create request. Okay, great. So now that we have created a lobby, the next important action is searching for lobbies. So let's make another function. So a private void, let's call it list lobbies. Then over here, let's go inside lobbies, access the static instance. And now let's call the function query lobbies async. And again, this one is awaitable. For the parameters, you can see we have an optional parameter. This is for filtering. If we leave it as empty, it's going to return all the lobbies. I'm going to showcase how to use the filters in a little bit. So this one, as we can see, returns a query response. So let's grab that. So the query response. And again, make sure this one is marked as async. All right, so we have our query response and now we can go inside that one. And over there, we've got the results. So this is a nice list containing all the results that we found. So let's do over here a debug log. Let's say lobbies found and query results account. So we found these lobbies. Then let's just cycle through them and print some data. So we just do a for each, for each lobby in the query response our results. And for each of these, let's do a log, log the lobby.name and perhaps let's say the lobby.max players. Okay, so since we did not use any filter, this is basically going to query for every single lobby that exists. Now again, remember to wrap this inside a try catch, otherwise this thing could break the entire game, so let's wrap it. And okay, let's test and see what this does. Alright, so here we are, I'm signed in. First, let's do our search, so let's call list lobbies, do our search, and yep, lobbies found zero, okay, makes sense. Now let's create a lobby. 
There you go, created, and now if we enlist again, yep, there you go, we found one lobby. To verify that it is indeed running, over here I've got two builds. So let's try doing a list, and nope, that one found zero, and on this one list, and nope, also found zero. Now on this one, let's create a lobby, and there you go, that one created, and now on this other one, if I list again, and if there you go, this one did find the lobby. So we have verified that we are indeed grabbing the lobby from the master server on the internet and not anything local. Okay, great. And again, I should point out that, like I said, over here, I'm just testing out the API. But as you might imagine, you can easily add a visual to all of the return values from all these functions. That's what I'm going to showcase when I showcase the fully working sample in a little bit. Now, one important thing about lobbies is they can become inactive if they receive no data in 30 seconds. So the lobby has been created. It has been a bit over 30 seconds. So now if I try to list lobbies again, let's see if it still finds the same one. And nope, there you go. Look at that. Zero lobbies found. So the lobby was created, but since we didn't send any data, we didn't update anything, after 30 seconds it became inactive. Inactive pretty much means that it does not show up on search, so new players cannot find it. However, players that are already on the lobby, they can still get data from that lobby. Now, when starting the game, you really want to keep the lobby alive until all players join. So in order to keep it alive, what we need to do is send a heartbeat. So when we create a brand new lobby, let's keep a reference to it. So let's go up here, make a private of type lobby, and let's call it the host lobby. And then down here, when we create our lobby, we get the lobby, the host lobby equals this lobby, okay? And now with this, we basically just need to run some logic every certain amount of time in order to trigger the heartbeat function. So we need to run some code every X amount of time. And if you want, you can do that in coroutine. But personally, I do not like coroutines. I don't like the pattern that they force you to use. So if you want, you can use them, but for me, I'm just going to use a basic float timer. So up here, just going to declare a float for the heartbeat timer. Then let's make a private void update. And then let's make a function handle lobby heartbeat. And we're going to run this on update. Now here, just do some basic timer, but obviously first check if the host lobby does not know. So if we have a host lobby, if so, count down the timer. Then if the timer has elapsed, if so, let's reset the timer. Now for the heartbeat, like I said, the lobby becomes inactive after 30 seconds of inactivity. So let's send a heartbeat, let's say every 15 seconds. So for actually sending the heartbeat, let's go inside the lobby service, the instance, and let's call the send heartbeat ping async. Then this requires an ID for the lobby ID. So let's grab in the host lobby and pass in the ID. And again, this one is awaitable, so let's await and make this one async. All right, so that's it. Let's test and see if our created lobby stays alive after 30 seconds. Okay, so first of all, let's list our lobbies. And nope, we've got zero, great. Let's create a brand new lobby. Okay, let's list them again. And yep, there it is. Okay, so now let's wait 30 seconds. Okay, it has been almost a minute. So let's list them again and see if it's still alive. And yep, there you go, the lobby is still alive. Okay, great. So our lobby is no longer becoming inactive. Now, like I mentioned over here, when listing lobbies, you can optionally add some filters. So let's see how to do that. This function takes a parameter of type query lobbies options. So let's make one of those. So query lobbies options. We can inspect this type to see what it contains. Here we've got a bunch of things. So for example, how many results we want to get, which ones we want to skip. And importantly, over here, we've got the filters and the order. So the filters are how we can narrow down which lobbies we want to get. So let's inspect the query filter. Over here on this one, a query filter contains a field options, a value, and an operation. For the field options, this is which field it's going to act upon. You can see there are some common ones. So you can filter by number of max players. You can filter by number of available slots. You can filter by the name, by when it was created, when it was last updated. And then these ones, the S1 through 5 and the N1 through 5, these are basically custom parameters which you can define yourself. The N simply means number and the S simply means string. So for example, when creating a lobby, you can define the S1 field. You can define that one as, for example, the game mode. And then when querying for lobbies, you can filter only the lobbies that have that specific game mode. Or alternatively, in terms of numbers, you could have, for example, a field for something like the player skill. And then you could filter for all lobbies with player skill within a certain amount. So that's all the structure. Now let's see how to actually use it. So over here, we create the new query lobbies options. Then like we saw, for example, we can set the count. So let's say we wanted to get just 25 results. And then for the filters, so this one is a list. So let's create a list of query filter. 
And then over here, we create as many query filters as we want. So first of all, for the options, for this one, let's go with available slots. Then for the value, let's go with zero. And then for the operation over here, you can see we've got all kinds of operations. So we have contains, if it contains this value, we've got equals, greater or equals, greater than, less or equals, less than, and not equals. So let's say right now we want to filter all the lobbies with at least one available slot, so more than zero. So let's go with greater than, and just like this. As you can see, this is a list, so you can add as many filters as you want, or we can add just one. So basically, just like this, this will return only lobbies that have more than zero available slots. And by the way, this one is actually a string, even though then it won't be parsed into an int, but yep, takes a string. Now, like I said, another thing you can do is sort the results. So over here, we can set the order. And once again, this one is also a list, a list of query orders. So let's create the new query order. First, you can set it as ascending, true or false. Let's say false to make it descending. And then for the field, let's go with when the lobby was created. So the lobbies will basically be sorted from the oldest to newest. All right, so here we define our options. Now we just pass it in over here into our function. So that's it. And again, like I mentioned over here, I'm really just showing you how to work with the API, how to call the functions and so on. But as you might imagine, in your game, you would have the UI and using the UI, you would have all kinds of buttons to set the filters. And then using that, you would construct over here these query lobbies options. Now for a quick test, let's try creating a lobby with just one player, which means we won't have any more players after we join when we create. So let's go up here when we've got the create lobby, instead of four players, let's put just one, okay. So now here, if I list lobbies, and nope, none are found, okay. Now let's create a lobby, and yep, it created. And if I list, and nope, there you go, also zero lobbies found, because again, there is no lobby with at least one available slot. All right, great, so far so good. Now, the next thing we want to do is be able to join a lobby. So over here, let's make another function. Let's make a private void, call it join lobby. And then over here, in order to join, we just go into lobbies, access the instance, and then we've got some join functions. As you can see, we've got two of them. So we can join a lobby by ID, or we can join by code. Here, just to test that we can join a lobby, let's go with join by ID and let's basically just copy this just to do a query and join the very first lobby. So just a quick test. So over here, do a query response, find the first one, and then let's go inside. Let's not apply anything. So no lobbies, no options, make this one async. So it finds whatever lobbies, and then let's say we join the very first one. So let's go into results on index zero, and we're going to grab the ID because we use join lobby by ID. And let's await this and remove the lobby. Okay, so this function should be able to join the very first lobby that it finds. So let me just add the command here. And then let's go up here and add some more players so we can join it. Okay, so let's test. So here with both builds, on this one, let's create a lobby. Okay, create it. Now this one, if we list, we should be able to see it. Yep. And if we use the join lobby, it should join that one. So let's click. And yep, there you go. It didn't do anything because there's no log, but yep, it did join the lobby. Again, obviously you can imagine how with a proper UI, you would first have a visual listing all of the lobbies, then the player would click and it would join that lobby based on that ID. That's exactly how my sample works, which again, I'm going to showcase in a little bit. Now, one important concept is the difference between public and private lobbies. Like name implies, a public lobby is searchable, so anyone can join, whereas a private lobby can only be joined directly either with the ID or the code. How we define it as public or private is over here when we create a lobby. So we've got this function which takes a lobby name, the max players, and then as we can see, it also takes a create lobby option. So let's create one of these, see what it does. So we create lobby options. Let's go inside this to see what this contains. And yep, it has this. So we've got a boolean for is private. So if this one is true, then it is private. If it is false, then it is public. Then we also got some information about the player creating the lobby and some more data for this lobby. We're going to see these two in a little bit. For now, let's just focus on the private. So we're here when creating one, let's set is private back into true. So we are going to create a private lobby. And then after creating, let's do a log. So let's also log the lobby.id. And let's also log the lobby.lobby code. And of course, up here, let's make sure to use our create lobby options. All right, so let's test. All right, here we are, and let's create a brand new lobby. And there you go, it created with that name, that many max players. And here we see a big string for our ID and then a smaller one for our nice lobby code. But importantly, we made this private. So now we find lists for lobbies. 
And up there you go, zero lobbies found. Because again, this one is set as private, so it does not show up to the public. The way we can join this private lobby is either through the ID, which again, that is a pretty complex string, so this one is not very useful for sending to your friends and so on. So because of that, you have a much shorter, much easier to read lobby code, and this is the one that you can send to anyone in order to join this private lobby. Alright, so let's go down into our join lobby function, and instead of joining the very first one after querying, let's get rid of this, and let's add a proper parameter. Let's add a string for the lobby code, and let's also rename this function, so join lobby by code. Then with that, let's use the other function, so join lobby by code async. And this one, as you can see, takes a string for the lobby code, so let's just pass in that one, so the lobby code. Then let's just do a debug log, let's say join lobby with code, and then the lobby code. Okay, so with this, let's test. All right, so here I have both builds. Now on this one, let's call create lobby, and there you go, create the lobby. So now on this other one, if I do list lobbies, that one is private, so yep, we still don't have the lobby found. And on this one, let's use the function join lobby by code, then let's pass in the code, it is that one. So k3k6pp, let's join. And if there you go, we join the lobby with this code. All right, awesome, everything worked. This is how you can join a lobby directly. Next, let's look at one really awesome lobby feature, which is quick join. It's perfect for getting players into your games very quickly without having to ask them which game they want to join. With quick join, your player just presses a button and they instantly join a lobby. To do that, let's make another function, so private void, let's call it quick join lobby. And over here we go into the lobby service, access the instance, and we're going to call the function quick join lobby async. As you can see, this one has some optional options. Using this you could filter, so for example you could have a quick join only on a certain map or a certain game mode and so on. But to make it super simple, you really just have this function. But again, this one is awaitable, so let's await. Let's make this async. And again, as always, don't forget to add the try catch. If you do, then it might cause an exception and break your whole game. So don't forget this. Okay, so we have this. Let me just make a command just for testing. And let's test. So here with both builds, let's create a lobby. And then on this one, let's do quick join lobby. And oh, there you go, it did not work. And by the way, here's a nice example of the errors. Thanks to the try catch, the game didn't break. We just got a really nice error function. And on this one, as we can see, it is saying that it failed to find any open lobbies. Again, that is because we made this one a private lobby, so this one cannot find it through quick join. Let's just quickly go here, go up into create lobby, and for this one, let's set is private back into false to make it public. So now again, over here, let's create a lobby. And there you go, created. And on this one, let's quick join lobby. And there you go, it does join quickly. Okay, great. So with this, we already have quite a lot working. We can create lobbies, we can list them and join them, but on the lobby itself, we still have no data. One very glaring example is the players have no name. We can see all the players inside a lobby by looking inside this lobby class. So this one over here, if we look, we see over here, yep, we've got a list of all of our players. And then if we look here on the definition of the player class, if we look at this one, you can see we've got an ID, connection info, allocation ID, join, last update, and so on. So as you can see, we have no field directly for a name. However, what it does have is over here a real nice dictionary. So basically the way this works is all of this data is up for you to define. So you have to decide what data you want to include with each player. You can, for example, include the name, you could include some kind of loadout, you could include some kind of selected character, some kind of icon, colors, whatever. This is a dictionary of generic data, so it's up to you to define what data each player needs to have. Let's first just make a function just to print all the details from the player. So let's go down here, make a simple function. Let's just call it print players. And we're going to receive a lobby object. So then let's cycle through player player in the lobby.players. So we go through this one and let's do a debug.log. And let's say, for example, the player.id. And up here, let's do a debug log. And let's say players in lobby. And then print out the lobby.name. All right, so we have this nice helper function. So up here, when we create a lobby, we've got the host lobby. Then let's call this function and pass in the host lobby. OK, so just like this, let's see what this prints. So here, if I just create a lobby, and if there you go, that's what it did. So it creates a lobby, players in the lobby, and as you can see, it is the ID of this player. Now let's see how we can actually add our proper data into it. 
Do we do that is actually what we saw a while ago. So we have the create lobby options. And if you remember over here inside, we've got a player. So this is the information about the player that is creating this lobby. So we can basically just add this inside. Let's set over here play equals and we construct a brand new player. And then for the player it takes all kinds of things. So for the ID, let's go into the authentication service, access the instance and let's get the player ID. And then we've got the data. So let's construct it. This one is a dictionary. So inside we can add as many keys as we want. So let's put in a key for something like the player name. Let's call this. And then let's give it a player name. And just for testing, we need to make sure that we have different names. So let's go up here to define a random name. So private string for the player name. And let's name it put code monkey and then do a unity engine random.range just to generate a random number. So let's say 10 and 99, nine, just so we can get a nice random number. With this, the editor in the build should have different names. Let's also print it over here on start. So a debug.log on the player name. Okay, so we have that. And then down here, let's pass in the player name equals this player name. Except this one is not a string, but rather we have to create a player that object. Then inside, we can define the visibility. This one, we have three options, member, private, and public. So public is as you expect. So this one is visible to anyone outside the lobby. Private means it is only visible to the host of the lobby. And member, this one is visible to every member in the lobby. I'm going to cover these in more detail in a little bit, but for now, let's just make it member. So it's visible to every member inside this lobby. Then for the value, let's put the player name and close this. And actually for the ID, we need to either send it over here in the constructor, or actually if we omit this, then it won't just grab it directly from the authentication. So let's leave it just like this. Okay, so basically with this, when we create a lobby, we are creating a lobby and passing in the player that is creating this lobby. And inside that player class, we are defining the data and we are defining a field for player name and we are setting it to the player name. So then down here, let's go into our print players function. Over here, we are printing the player ID. And then let's also print the player. Let's go inside the data and let's grab the player name. This contains a player that object. So let's go inside and grab the value. All right, so let's print it and see if it does say the name of the player that is creating the lobby. And actually random.range apparently cannot be called directly from the constructor. So instead of generating the name here, let's just copy this, erase this and define the player name here. Okay, so let's test. So here we are, and that's the generate name, so code monkey 91 So now if we create a lobby, and if there you go, it did create a lobby, and the players inside this lobby has this ID and this really nice name. All right, now let's make sure this works also when joining. Again, for all the functions, we need to create a player object and pass it in. So for example, down here, when we've got the join lobby by code, for example, on this one, we've got the function, we take the lobby code, and then we also have the option, so we need to also include that. So join lobby by code options. So let's construct one of these. And then over here we have the player. So this is the player that is joining. And instead of copy pasting a ton of code, let's actually make a function to return a new player object. So let's just make something like this. So private going to return a player. So get player. And over here, just return a new player doing exactly that. Okay, so now let's use this function. So up here, instead of defining that, let's call get player. Okay, like this, and then down here when we are joining, let's put the exact same thing, player get player, and then we just pass in this inside there. Okay, we do this, and finally, let's also print our players, just to see all the players inside, so we join the lobby and print the players inside this lobby. So this one actually returns a lobby for the join lobby, and it is this one. So let's print like this. Okay, so let's test. All right, so here are both builds. This one is CodeMonkey56 and this one is CodeMonkey80. All right, so on this one, let's create a lobby. And yep, there you go, and the lobby has that code, so let's use that to join. So over here, let's join the lobby. Let's put that one, G, D, M, E, E, J, let's join. And yep, there you go, it joined, and over there, we can see both names of both our players. All right, great, so with this, our players now have some proper names. Basically, what we did here is we defined some per player data, like I said, that can be whatever you want. So it can be as simple as a player name, or maybe on a game kind of like League of Legends, perhaps you would store the player chosen champion. Or perhaps in a game like Battlefield, you could store the player loadout. As you saw, it takes a dictionary so you can store whatever that you want. 
And the other type of data that you can store is on the lobby itself. So for example, this would be the game mode, which obviously you don't want one game mode per player, you want just one game mode for the entire lobby. How we set that up is pretty much exactly the same way. So let's go into the lobby create. So up here, we've got the create lobby options. And if we inspect this again, over here, we see the exact same thing. So we've got a dictionary of our data. So when creating a lobby, let's create, let's put data and construct a brand new dictionary. And on the dictionary, let's add an entry. So for the string, for our key, let's say our game mode. And then for our data object, let's construct it. Again, we need to pass in the visibility. So again, public means it is visible to anyone outside. Private means only visible to this host and member only visible to people inside the lobby. So for a game mode, you want it to be public. You want it to show up in the server browser so that people can select which game mode they want to join. So let's make it public. And then for the value, let's say capture the flag. I should also point out that there's one final optional parameter. This one is for the index. And this one, as you can see, we've got string one through five and numbers one through five. Like we saw a while ago for the search, these are the indexes that are used in there. So you could define this game mode, define this one as the S1 index. And then down here when listing for lobbies, you could make a filter. Let's put one right here. So let's say you could make a new query filter, create search for things, and let's search for S1, which is the one that we use up here. So you could search for that. Then for the value, let's say capture the flag. And finally, for the operations, we would go with equals. So using this query filter, you would basically only find all of the lobbies that have captured the flag in their game mode. So for more complex use cases, these indexes are super useful. But for now, for this simple demo, let's remove this and just put it just like this. So just a simple game mode. And that's it. This is how we can assign some data, whatever that we want, to our brand new lobby. Let's go down here into the print players and let's also print it. So we've got the lobby name, then let's also print the lobby. Let's grab the data, grab the game mode and inside grab the value. And also up here when we are listing the lobbies. So let's see this one listing the lobbies, print the name, the max players. And let's also print the lobby data, grab the game mode and print the value. OK, so let's see like this. All right. So here let's create a lobby. And yep, there you go, it created, and we can see the players in the lobby with the name my lobby and the game mode capture the flag. And if we do a list lobbies, yep, we also see, yep, there's the lobby with capture the flag. The reason why it found two is because I accidentally ran create lobby twice, but yep, everything is working. With this, we now know how to set per player data and per lobby data. But of course, over here, we are only setting that data when we are creating a lobby. Obviously, you want to also be able to update it after the lobby has been created. You want to be able to change the game mode, the name, and so on. So let's make a function to update the game mode. So let's go down here. Let's make a private void update game mode. Actually, rename this to update lobby game mode. OK. Then let's receive a string for the game mode. And for updating, let's go inside lobbies, the instance. And let's call update lobby async. This one, first of all, takes a lobby ID. So actually up here, we're already storing our host lobby. So let's grab this one. Let's go down here, use this host lobby dot ID. And then we've got the update lobby options. So let's construct an object of that type. And over here, we can set the data and let's pass in the brand new data. So game mode and let's make a new one. And let's do it like this. And as usual, let's put this inside a try catch. So a try catch. OK, so we update the lobby with this ID and we're going to modify the game mode. Then let's print the players, which is going to print the brand new game mode. Although it actually won't do that because of two sync issues. The first one is that this lobby object, this is a class, but this does not get updated automatically. Instead, you need to pretty much get the one that is returned from the lobby service. So when updating, this returns a lobby. So let's update our host lobby with the one that we receive here. So let's add this one into this one. And actually, this one is awaitable. So let's await an async. So like this, when we print, we should be able to see the updated game mode. So here we are. And if we create a lobby, yep, there you go. Capture the flag. OK, great. Now let's update the lobby game mode. Let's say that match. And if there you go, we did update. OK, great. One more thing, if you have multiple pieces of data over here, you only need to assign the ones that you want to update. So for example, let's go up here when we create a lobby, let's create a new piece of data. So let's say the map 
then the same thing and you that object let's also make it public and let's say we are on dust 2 okay so we have a map and then down here when updating the game mode we only want to update the game mode so when printing let's also print the map and make sure that the map still exists so lobby data let's pick up the map and the valley okay so let's see this so here if we create a lobby and yep there you go capture the flag on dust 2 okay makes sense now let's update the lobby game mode let's put it on conquest and if there you go the game mode did update but the map did not update so basically over here when updating you don't need to include every single piece of data you only need to include the things that you want to modify okay so it looks like it's working but like i said there's another sneaky issue here let's do a quick log to see the lobby data all the time so let's go on our update let's actually print so we don't want just the host lobby but also let's say the join lobby so we have this one and when the host lobby changes so over here when you set it let's set the join lobby equals the host lobby again we just want to keep a reference of the lobby that we just joined so on this one when we update the host lobby let's also put this one equals that one and then over here let's say the join lobby by code on this one when you join the lobby let's also update that one so let's rename this one to lobby and then put join lobby equals this lobby all right, so we have this now on the print players. Let's actually make another version of this function. So print players with no parameters, and we're just going to call print players and pass in the join lobby. Then let's just make this a command just so we can test it out. Okay, so this way we can manually trigger this log. So let's see what this does. So over here, we got both builds. Now on this one, let's create a lobby. It's going to create and join it. And there you go. Okay, so this one joined. Now on this one, let's call join lobby. And let's pass in the code to join that lobby. Let's join. And if there you go, it joined. So we can see code monkey 76 and 30. So this one is 30, this one's 76. Okay, great. And over here, if I call that function print players, here we can already see one issue, but let's do another thing. Let's update the lobby game mode. Let's change this one to deathmatch. And there you go, this one seems like it updated. So there you go, it's got deathmatch instead of capture the flag. But now on this one, now let's call print players and let's see what this one does and there you go this one still says capture the flag so we updated the game mode on the lobby but this player apparently has no idea that happened this player does not know that the lobby data changed in any way it still thinks that the game mode is capture the flag instead of being deathmatch here it is important to remember how lobby is not a real-time connection kind of like netcode for game objects meaning it does not update automatically in order to update anything like the game mode, the map, or anything, in order to do that, you need to manually pull for updates. So let's make another function with a simple timer so we can pull for updates. Let's make a private void handle lobby pull for updates. By the way, there are obviously some rate limits when it comes to polling. You cannot pull 60 times per second. You can see the rate limits over here on the lobby documentation. So for polling for updates, we can do one request per second. Now here, let's do a timer. And again, if you like, you can use a coroutine. For me, I'm going to make another basic float timer. So a private float, lobby update timer. And then down here, run pretty much the exact same logic. So let's actually copy this directly, just replace this. So we're going to test this on the join lobby. And then for the lobby update timer, let's replace all of these. So this one and this one. Now for the lobby update timer max, for this one, like we saw, we can only update once per second. So let's put this one at 1.1 seconds. Just make sure it doesn't hit the limit. So we do this and then the function that we're going to use is the get lobby async. And this one, as you can see, is going to return a lobby. So let's pass in the join lobby ID. And this one returns a lobby lobby. And again, remember this class is not auto update. So let's replace our join lobby with this lobby. And again, this one is await, so let's make this async. And finally, we just need to call this over here on our update. Okay, so that's it. This should be getting updates on every second. So let's test. So here we are, let's create a lobby. And yep, there it is. On this one, let's join the lobby. Use the key. All right, it joined the lobby with capture the flag and so on. And as we saw a while ago on this one, if I call the print players, it would not update, it would not show that this other player joined, but now that we added polling, this one should work. So if we press enter, yep, there you go, this one does see that two players are on there. So now on this one, if I try to update the lobby mode, let's say to deathmatch, 
So there you go, this one updates right away, and on this one just need to wait for one second, and now print players, and if there you go, this one does receive the update, so now this one knows that the game mode is deathmatch. Alright, awesome, so they both got the update, everything is working, all the data is nicely being synchronized. And of course, since we can update the unlobby data, so we can update the unlobby game mode, we can also update all of the player data. It works pretty much exactly the same way. So let's go down here, make another function. So private void, let's call it update player name and receive a string for the new player name. And let's also update the variable up there. Player name equals the new player name. Then we just need to go into the unlobby service, the instance, and let's update player async, not lobby, player. This one takes a lobby ID, so let's use the join lobby dot ID. Then the player ID, so let's go into the authentication service, grab the instance and the player ID. And finally, we've got the update player options. And on this one, let's update the data. And let's put the exact same thing that we saw up here. So let's see the function where we're getting the player. So we get this data, let's update this data. Let's put the player name and use our new player name. Once again, let's put this inside a nice try catch make sure that nothing breaks. Finally make this a wait and over here a sync. And note how this one also returns a lobby. So if you wanted to update instantly you could grab this one. Or since we already updated polling we can just wait one second and it will auto update. Alright so let's test and see if we can update the player name. So over here let's create a lobby. Then on this one let's join the lobby. Then on this one let's call update the player name. And let's say this one is now Iron Man. So it updates and it should have pawned already. So if we go into print players, yep, this one is now Iron Man. And on this one, same thing. If we print players, yep, there you go, that one is Iron Man. All right, awesome. So we can update both player data and lobby data. Now, the next important ability is the ability to simply leave a lobby. So let's make a function for that. Call it just leave lobby. And then over here, it's pretty simple. We just go inside the lobby service, the instance, and just call remove player async. This one takes in lobby ID, so let's pass in the join lobby dot ID. And then the player ID, so let's go into the authentication service. And let's grab this player ID. As usual, make this a wait, make this one async. And let's add the try catch. All right, so that's it, pretty simple, let's test. So on this one down here, let's create a lobby. Then on this one up here, let's join the lobby. Okay, both players are currently inside this lobby, so print players, yep, both players are there. Now on this player, let's call leave lobby, and down here, let's print it again, so print players, and yep, there you go, that player did leave. Okay, great. Now, this function, as you can see, takes an ID for the player. If it is this player ID, then obviously this player leaves. But if this code is running on the host, then essentially with this, you can kick some players. So let's make a function to try that out. So private void, let's call it kick player. Then over here, let's do the exact same thing and let's just kick the second player. So in here, let's go into the join lobby. Let's grab the players and let's kick the second player since the first one is going to be the host. So let's do it just like this. Okay, so let's test. So down here, let's create a new lobby. Then on this one, let's join it. Okay, so both are currently inside. Now on this one, let's kick the other player and let's print the players. And yep, only this one is inside. And also one very important thing is over here on the player that was kicked, we don't have any event or anything. Again, remember how lobby is not a real-time connection. It is all based on polling. And what happens when the player is kicked is polling for that lobby simply returns null. Basically up here, when we call get lobby async, the amount of data that we get in this lobby object depends if we are a member or not, which again goes back to the visibility options that we saw here. So since this one is kicked and is no longer a member, when we call this, we can still see the game mode and the map, but we cannot see what players are inside. So if we try printing the players, this one is going to be null, so we're going to have a null reference here. Over here, if I try printing the players, yep, there you go, null reference. Now, one thing you might be thinking right now is what happens if the host decides to leave and the answer is lobby has automatic host migration. So both players are currently inside. There you go, 63 and 17. Yep, both are inside the same lobby. And on this one, on the host, let's simply leave the lobby. And there you go, the host left. And on this one, if we call print players, yep, there you go, only this one is inside and this one has now become the host. If there are multiple players on the lobby, then the host is chosen at random. And also over here, you can see an error happened. 
That's because we still try to send a heartbeat, even though we already left that one, so we're no longer the host. Now, alternatively, you can also manually handle host migration. So let's make a function, call it migrate lobby host. And to do that, we do it pretty much exactly like we update the lobby data. So we're here updating the game mode. Let's actually copy all of this. Let's go down here. And we're going to call update lobby async. Let's just make this async. And over here, if we inspect the update lobby options, over here, if we scroll down, we can see, yep, we've got a host ID. So this is the ID of the player that is the host of this lobby. So over here, instead of modifying the game mode, let's say we want to modify the host ID. And for example, let's make the second player the host. So let's grab the second player ID, just like this. All right, so let's test. Down here, let's create a lobby. Then on this one, let's join it. And then back to this one down here. On this one, let's call migrate lobby host. Okay, it did it. And now, for example, if we try to update the lobby game mode, let's try changing this to deathmatch. And oh, there you go, we've got an error. We can see this user does not have the authority to update the lobby. Yet another question you might have is what happens if everyone leaves the lobby? And the answer is simple, the lobby is automatically deleted. If there's no one inside, it gets deleted. And if you want, you can also manually delete it yourself. So let's make a function, delete lobby. And then this one is pretty simple. Just go inside lobby service, the instance, and just call delete lobby async. And this takes a lobby ID. So let's pass in the join lobby dot ID. All right, that's it. Let's test. So on this one down here, I created the lobby. On this one up here, I joined. And now over here, let's delete this lobby. And yep, there you go, it's done. And as you can see, we're getting errors because the lobby has been deleted. All right, great. So these are all of the abilities of the lobby tool. Really awesome. Now, before I showcase my final sample, let's just quickly look at pricing. Here is the Unity Gaming Services pricing page. And if we scroll down and we find lobby, so yep, here it is. On the left side is the free tier and on the right side is the pay tier. And as you can see, as usual, there's a very generous free tier. For a lobby, you have 10 gigabytes for free per month per each region group. That is a pretty massive amount. Lobby uses very little data, so unless your game is a massive hit, it will likely be completely free to you. So finally, here is the sample that I've built using all of these features. You can download this sample and inspect all the source code. Since you've watched this whole video, you should be able to easily read all the code in this sample. The main script is this one, a lobby manager. And here it's got pretty much all the functions that we already saw. So a function to handle the lobby heartbeat, one for polling, get the join lobby and so on, create a lobby. So all the exact same functions that we just saw. Then on top of it are some UI elements that hook onto this class. For example, here we've got the lobby list UI. I've got a simple container inside. I've got a template with the lobby name, the amount of players and the game mode. What I call template is pretty much just a local prefab. So this template, this gets duplicated in order to create more list entries. There's a refresh button and a button to create a brand new lobby. Here on that UI script, when I click on the refresh button, this one calls this function. And then this function simply goes into the lobby manager and refreshes the lobby list. So this one does a lobby query. So pretty much just like we saw, finds all the lobbies and then fires off an event and passes in the list of lobbies. Then the UI script over here, it simply listens to that event. So on the lobby list changed. So when that happens, it simply goes here, destroys the previous lobbies on the list and adds the new ones. So as you can see, it literally is just a very simple UI script built on top of all the functions that we already saw. By the way, you can obviously make the list auto refresh. I actually made that code. So over here on the lobby manager, if we scroll down into the update, we are handling the refresh lobby list. Then for this one, what this code does is super simple. It checks if Unity services have been initialized and if the player is signed in. If so, again, just count down a simple timer and call that function. I simply commented this out because I'm running multiple builds on one machine. So that means that all of the lobby requests are coming from the exact same IP. So if I were to enable auto refresh with multiple builds, I would end up being rate limited since each instance would be making too many requests. But in the final game, yep, you would use exactly this. So with two builds running, first it asks for the player name and then there's a button to authenticate. Basically what I'm doing here is just a simple trick to allow the demo to work with multiple builds on one PC. If you just authenticate automatically, you will always get the exact same player ID, which then can cause issues because you cannot join the same lobby with the same ID. So over here, I just added some super simple logic so I can click on this button in order to edit the player name. Let's say this one is Iron Man. 
By the way, this input window is something that I made in a previous video. So with this, I can easily change the name. And then when I click on authenticate, it runs this function, which takes a string for the player name. And over here, just creates an object of type initialization options. And over here, using the player name in order to set the profile. And then it's used over here to initialize Unity services. This way, even when running multiple builds on the same PC, they get different player ID since they're using different profiles. Again, I'm doing this just for the demo, just to make it work with multiple builds on the same PC. Unless you specifically want to implement profiles, there's no need to do this in your final game. Okay, so with both these, let's authenticate and authenticate. Now this one up here, let's create a lobby. So just click on the plus button and it shows this nice UI. Then all of the usual settings that we saw are used for creating the lobby. So over here, let's edit the lobby name. Let's call it my fun lobby. Then I can make it public or private. Let's make it public. Include any number of players. So let's say five players. And the mode that it capture the flag or contest. And just go ahead, click on create, and there you go, the lobby was created. So now on this one, if I refresh, and yep, there you go, I can see the MyFun lobby running Capture the Flag with one out of five players. Then by just clicking here, it's going to join the lobby. It's just going to call this function, which is going to join the lobby by ID. So here, just join, and yep, there you go, this is the lobby UI. This one is pretty similar to the list UI. Instead of having a list of lobbies, it just has a list of all the players. Now while inside the lobby, I can view all of the other players inside this lobby. And I can also see a nice icon of the character that they are using. Again, this is the custom data that you can define. I just defined something for a character. So let's say on this one up here, yep, I do want to use the Marine, but on this one down here, let's say I want to use a Ninja. So there you go, I clicked that button, it updated the player data, and that was propagated to all of the players. Then on the host, there are also some more buttons which are hidden from the clients. There's this button down here which toggles the game mode, so if I click on it, there you go, that one becomes Conquest, and yep, that one gets the update. And the other button is this one, which allows me to kick a player. So if I click on this, and if there you go, that player was kicked from that lobby. Alternatively, I've got a button up here to leave the lobby. So if I click on it, I go back to the list. And if we refresh, we cannot find the lobby because again, everybody left the lobby, so the lobby was deleted. Okay, so as you can see, all of the functionality is here, working on this very simple demo. I can create lobbies. With other ones, I can search for lobbies. I can also join them. I can join with multiple players. I can change my character. I can kick some out from a lobby. I can refresh again, join another one, and so on. So this has all the functions that we saw, except being applied to a nice UI. You can download the project files and maybe use this as a starting point for your next multiplayer game. All right, so that's Lobby. It's a really awesome tool for managing your multiplayer lobbies. As you can see, it's extremely feature complete, allowing you to do everything you need from a lobby, and it's all pretty easy to use. Like I mentioned, all the Unity Gaming Services tools work very well with one another. So stay tuned for the next video where I will explain how Relay works and how to make a multiplayer game with Lobby, Relay, and Netcode for game objects. Alright, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.